So let's go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, my name is Jennifer Lawson and I'd like to welcome uh, you and thank you for joining us for the third and final webinar in our series on climate change, health and social justice. Uh, today we'll consider the impact and potential of an environmental, social and governance approach. We're grateful for the support of the series um, from Sustainable Duke, the Trent Center for Bioethics, Humanities and History of Medicine and the Provost Office through an intellectual community planning grant. Uh, let's see, Oops. sorry. Um, as we begin, uh, we wanna acknowledge that we're hosting this series on the traditional territory and land of the Saponi peoples. Here we see examples of some of their ongoing activities around health, healing, and education. Um, so we'd like to extend a warm welcome and thanks to our speakers for joining us here today. Please let me introduce them. Dr. Carol He is a teaching assistant professor in the Environment, Ecology, and Energy program at UNC Chapel Hill and an adjunct associate professor in the Environmental Sciences and Policy Division of the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. Dr. He has been teaching classes focused on the intersection of business and the environment for over a decade. First at Keenan Flagler Business School and now as a member of the interdisciplinary faculty in the UNC Environment, Energy, and Ecology program. She's an active corporate sustainability consultant whose capstone class engages undergraduate students in projects for external clients. Dr. He has won numerous teaching awards, including the Johnson Teaching Excellence Award and the Weatherspoon Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. She earned her PhD from UNC Chapel Hill, Department of Marine Sciences for research concerning the global carbon cycle and factors controlling the storage of carbon in marine sediment and her MBA from Keenan Flagler Business School. Um, Dr. Emily Sine is an assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. She's a clinician at the World Trade Center Health Program Center of Clinical Excellence. She's former chair of Sustain Mount Sinai, the executive sustainability committee for Mount Sinai Health System and founder of Clinical Climate Change and annual academic conference for allied health professionals. She studies the impact of healthcare delivery on the climate crisis and opportunities for health systems as business entities to reduce their environmental footprints and operational costs. She's a teacher and mentor in the medical and graduate schools with specific expertise in the drivers and health impacts of the climate crisis and sustainability practices. Dr. Sine was a broadcast news health and medical correspondent for more than 20 years with CBS News and PBS News. Welcome, we will begin today's presentation with Dr. He, thanks. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, what we'd like to do today um, is first share some definitions of ESG and some trends with the goal of providing what I hope will be you know, a more expansive and engaging definition. Oh, I'm sharing the wrong thing. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, yeah, and if any questions come up as we go on, please enter them in the chat. Um, we're a small enough group, you can feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so the, the way I wanted to start, I thought it'd be helpful to kind of lay some groundwork and maybe share with you some definitions of ESG and sustainability that perhaps are different from ones you have heard. Um, I also wanted to share um, some trends, uh, some data that I think will be really encouraging, and then end with you know, Emily's focus on what are the implications of um, these trends and the need to address you know, climate change for the healthcare sector. <coughs> so first thing I wanna say is that um, it's really obvious that the language used in discussions about sustainability um, and the topics that brought us together are, are really diverse. You know, there's not one 
um, set of core terms that everyone agrees on or uses consistently. And in fact, the terms that are used really vary depending on the context and, and even like what's more or less fashionable. Like since COVID times, ESG has become, you know, the, the term of art and what you hear most discussions around. Um, but I, you know, I, I agree with, with Shakespeare. Like all these terms are, are pretty much saying the same thing, um, but if one term you know resonates more with you or with the people you're interacting with and that term can help galvanize action then i say say go with it i, I don't want to necessarily debate um jargon um i'd much rather focus energies um and have you all focus your energy on on making actual progress so um just for some background, the term ESG, um, you know, like I said, pre-COVID times, it was used almost exclusively by the financial sector, uh, standing for environmental and social and governance factors that um, either investors would take into account when choosing how to deploy their, you know, financial capital or like banks in their lending decisions, you know, when they would evaluate risk, right? So ESG um, really has its, ESG term really has its roots um, with the money folks. So terms like CSR and the triple bottom line, or, you know, you're probably familiar with the three Ps or the three Es, um, you know, these, I think we're a lot more common in the late 90s and you know especially at my time in the business school like we talked about sustainability and the triple bottom line all the time and and those things go back to the Rio Earth Summit and uh, the Brundtland definition of sustainability which uh, again I would guess some of you are familiar with um, so Brundtland defines sustainability as the ability to meet the needs of current generations without sacrificing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. The term shared value, the last one on this list, um, and I'll talk more about this one in just a minute, uh, it was coined by Michael Porter. Uh, he's a Harvard Business School professor and really thought of as like the strategy, father of management strategy. I mean, he literally like wrote the book on management strategy. Um, so, and he used the term shared value. It, it really brought these concepts into the mainstream. So much like the diversity in this list of terms, there's also diversity in like, visuals that have been created to try to capture what these concepts are about. And, I want to spend a minute or two talking about what I see as strengths and weaknesses of these, partly in a way to position you to, to carry this conversation forward um, into the communities which you're a part. Um, so first is this, you know, equilateral triangle, um, you know, with people, planet, and profit, or the three E's. And um, the issue I have with this is that, like, placement on the triangle may infer priority. Right, so you know, this is an image um, I copied and then altered after a Google image search and it had profit at the top. And being an equilateral triangle, it, it can infer that you know, it's okay to sacrifice people or to sacrifice the planet. Um, so we balance out you know, their needs with the need to make profit. And I don't think that's the message that we wanna convey, right? That instead, you know, people's health and well-being and equity should be primary concerns. Um, so another image you may have seen on um, this really common is this Venn diagram. And I guess being a student of set theory in the past, um, I also see problems with this. Um, you'll note that the area of overlap is really small, right? Um, and I, I fear that this implies that there are really limited opportunities um, or only limited circumstances where you can successfully integrate concerns about people, planet, and the profit, right? Um, other images try to address that shortcoming by saying, well, actually, it's like a three-legged stool, or there are these three pillars that uphold, 
you know, a sustainable society or sustainable economy. And, and that's our goal. And I like this one uh, a little bit better, although it's not clear what the relationship is between these three different factors in this type of diagram. Um, oops, so an attempt to remedy that is this um, embedded spheres approach. And I really do like this one because it, um, it recognizes that you know, our economy is just one part of the society. Right? And our society and all human life depends on the environment on this one earth that we live in. And so I think that's really accurate. Um, and I'll offer a slight modification of this, um, this one in a couple of minutes too. And now, um, I'll say I'm not a graphic artist. I was thinking um, in preparation for this talk, maybe it's time that I hire somebody who can make a, a better uh, version here, um, which is um, that I would like to take the, the three spheres that people talk about in the triple bottom line um, and defining each one, uh, but then bringing them together and then and saying like, it's not just that there's a, a small opportunity for overlap, but these three things need to consistently and proactively be taken under consideration. And in fact, um, you know, here's, my, here's my little creative skin here, used as a lens through which um, we interrogate the world, which we see um, our opportunities, which we um, come up with a list of priorities and action items so that all of our decision-making is, is driven by this, um, this vision of thinking about what's good, not only you know, for business objectives um, or for our organization, but what's good for society, what's good for people and what's good for ecosystems and the planet too. Um, this is how I start all my classes. Um, at UNC and at Duke by saying um, sustainability is going to give you a new way of seeing the world, right? And you'll hear I even I um, use the word sustainability, but you can easily just plug in ESG, right? The integration of ESG factors would provide you a new way of seeing, um, more importantly, a new way of thinking and acting that would help you make decisions that um, integrate concern for people on the planet. Right. Um, so there's debate is interesting. Just last week, I, I read a paper about someone decrying the rise of the term ESG because of its roots in the financial sector. Um, and I agree with that to some extent. You know, I, I really hesitate to give more agency, uh, more power to the financial sector and have them dictate, you know, the language we use and define terms and then set priorities um, because I don't think money should be our primary concern. Um, but like I said before, if that's what creates buy-in and builds traction and then creates change, then, then go for it. So I would just encourage all of you to take a similar utilitarian approach, like consider your audience and use the words that most move them. So maybe before I continue on, since we're a smaller group, I'd be curious to hear if anyone has uh, a comment or a reflection they'd like to share, you know, perhaps another definition, um, a term or image that you have found helpful in promoting uh, dialogue or engagement. I'm happy to share. Um, my name is Jason Elliott and I work for Sustainable Duke. And so thank you for this presentation. We talk a lot about how to visualize and define sustainability, particularly as we are trying to pull people out of the like mindset of like, it's just recycling or biking to work. I get it. And just trying to actually expand it a little bit. Um, and as we're thinking more in the academic sphere at Duke University for undergrads, they have like areas of knowledge, which I think of as like climate change or health. And then we have modes of inquiry, which are like 
ways to learn. And I keep thinking about sustainability there. And so I really appreciated your like using it as a lens um, approach. And so a way to approach a, an issue or a topic versus it being just a topic by itself. Right, right. And so if you, it's more, um, yeah, like I, I uh, and my class was talking about like a new set of glasses um, that students have. So you carry them with you no matter what way of thinking you're adopting, you know, whether if you're taking an analytic or an artistic or innovative approach or, um, or whether you're in any specific sphere, you know, science, healthcare, government, military, um, this integrated view that keeps people and planetary health at, at the forefront. Um, I think it, it is the way to go. Thanks for that, Jason. Great, well, hopefully um, today's seminar in conjunction with the earlier ones, you know, can help add to your lexicon and um, enrich the conversations that you have. Um, so what I'm gonna do next is share with you some perspectives of thought leaders that um, I think are really useful in providing additional clarity and, and even some ins inspiration. Um, and so I wanna start with this concept of shared value that I said comes from Michael Porter, you know, the father of management strategy. So it's really significant when Michael Porter came out with a paper about shared value is that, um, you know, again, he's a mainstream guy. He's from Harvard. Um, he works and helped found a uh, McKinsey Consulting Company. So quite in the mainstream, you know, conservative ivory tower guy, um, really in contrast to an environmentalist or an activist like John Elkington, who termed the coin triple bottom line or, or Paul Hawkins. Um, you know, it, it's one thing when folks like that talk about sustainable development, but it's another thing when it's, you know, Porter from Harvard, right? Um, you know, he, he was saying the same things, but he used the different terms. And because of who he was, you know, his, his voice, he had a different platform. <laughs> so what was, so besides that, the other thing that was noteworthy about Porter's shared value concept is that it shifted the focus away from the idea that sustainability meant that companies were gonna to have to sacrifice quality or that companies were gonna to have to incur more cost, um, that somehow sacrifice would be involved. And instead, Porter focused on opportunity. Um, that you know, if businesses engaged and took that profit motive and directed it towards addressing social environment problems that there could be win-win. Uh, so what I have in this list are some examples that Porter shares about how you can do things that are good for people and planet and these things are good for business too. So this focus on you know, opportunity, focus on the upside was really different from um, the focus on just minimizing harm or reducing the downside that had been uh, really at the core of a lot of discussions earlier. The other thing about Porter and his paper on shared value is that it came out around the same time that Walmart was making news for its sustainability commitments. And so together those two, and I'll say more about Walmart in a minute, but together these things really we're like this neon flashing sign that sustainability had come into the mainstream. Um, in fact, it was just shortly after this, the, um, the organization that accredits business schools made it a policy that in order to be able to give out business degrees, business schools needed to teach about corporate sustainability. So no longer was it like optional or just for the liberal, you know, elite green schools, this was something for everybody. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, the share the slides will be shared with you. And like here, for example, this um, Michael Porter that's underlined, it's a link to his TED talk. 
So I tried to include lots of sources and, and link kind of like as Easter eggs to give you some additional resources to follow up on if you're interested in, in learning more about any of these folks. Uh, so next up uh, is Van Jones and you may know him. Um, I, I only listen to NPR, so I didn't realize this um, for several years that he is a, a famous CNN commentator now, but uh, I originally got to know Jones because of his work in environmental justice um, and human rights. So in the early 2000s, uh, he worked at the Ella, Benner Saker, Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, and he was President Obama's green jobs czar. Um, so this slide has two quotes that um, I really love. Um, because I think they're really inspiring um, and because they're really expansive. So back to Jason's comment about, you know, people thinking about sustainability as like double-sided printing or recycling aluminum cans. Van Jones is saying a green economy is, um, and I'll read just part of this for you. It should be an economy where we don't have any throwaway resources Right? But we don't have any throwaway species. We don't have any throwaway children or neighborhoods either. We don't have any throwaway nations. So building a green economy is not just about reclaiming throwing away stuff. It's about reclaiming throwing away lives. Um, and he goes on to say, you know, all these different ways that you can get people involved, right? And have a, an inclusive economy. So it's, you know, affluent people can spend money. Um, and he mentions like, um, rich people can put solar panels on their second home. Um, but also ordinary people can save money like through weatherization um, and people can earn money through green jobs. And so if you talk about jobs, if you talk about health, if you talk about wealth creation, people wanna be a part of that. And he says, we've talked so much about the crisis, we haven't talked enough about the opportunity. And I think that's really important today when you know there's so much, um, I want to use the word despair, but so many people are just, you know, on their last thread. Um, we've all been stretched so much, right? Our reserve capacity has been really tapped out from COVID. And there's so much division um, since the Trump years that has bubbled to the surface and, and can no longer be ignored. So a focus on what Jones calls the green economy or what you could call incorporation of ESG factors or a sustainable development, I think provides a vision that can lift us up and you know bring more people together. So that's Jones, and again, there's a, a link um, to his video, to a video with him in it. Um, now this is Jeff Hollander. You um, may not know him, but you may know his products. He is the founder of Seventh Generation Cleaning Products. Um, and what Hollander is really big on these days and focused on is um, saying, we don't wanna just be less bad, we wanna focus on doing good. Um, so let me just read a part of this. We wanna have a sustainable economy, we wanna have a sustainable form of capitalism. You know, he's talking specifically about products, but I would say, you know, we need organizations, you know, healthcare systems, companies, banks that um, do business that's good, right? Sustainability, he says, may not even be enough, right? Because we have a world that's so messed up, we don't want to sustain it, right? How true is that? So we want to renew and repair the damage and have a, a net positive effect. And, um, I thought this has particular resonance for the healthcare sector. It's not good enough to just um, make people sick and then spend money to help make them better because that just costs too much. We have to prevent them from getting sick in the first place and invest in optimizing wellness. So I really, I couldn't agree more with, with Hollander and his paper on net positive, I think is, um, is really, inspiring because we do need to transform from 
just being less bad isn't, you know, good enough. I always use that example of it, like a, a, re, a plastic water bottle and they're getting thinner and thinner and the caps are getting smaller and smaller, but there's still disposable plastic water bottles and we don't have a robust plastics recycling ecosystem. So um, it shouldn't just be less plastic. It should be no plastic. So we can't just sustain our current trajectory. We have to um, have these different goals. And I think that's also more inspiring. Um, I've had lots of debates with folks at UNC when our um, last chancellor's sustainability strategy was called the three zeros. So the goal was zero. And I wanted to say, and it was like zero carbon emissions, um, zero water impacts and zero waste. And I said, I think we can do better than zero. Zero is not really inspiring, right? We should have a goal of um, renewal, repair, um, restoration, or um, instead of even just being well, thriving, right? Or flourishing, you know, really reaching um, and pushing potentials. So I think. This vision can also have really good resonance in healthcare settings because of healthcare's focus on healing, right? And even going beyond healing to get at root causes. And, um, you know, that, that's what scientists and doctors do, right? Really understand the drivers and then engage in prevention and promoting wellness um, so that the you're preventing the problem instead of trying to clean up the mess after the fact. So the um, fourth perspective I wanna share is one that um, Jennifer Lawson shared with me. And um, so you might be familiar with him, but I was not until just the other day. Um, Howard Frumpkin, uh, he is leading the charge on this new field or term called planetary health. Um, oh, and it looks like my link to him dropped out. Hmm. I can edit that. Um, so he is um, talking about human health being intricately connected into our planetary health. So I, for him, would you know go back to the embedded circle diagram and add the person, right? And that the person's health is really a at the root or the core um, of, of our concern. Now, Frumpkin introduced me to Kate, Kate Raworth. Um, if you don't know her, um, I do invite you to follow this link and um, learn more. Um, this is a link to her TED Talk, uh, where she talks about donut economics. So of course, um, donuts are delicious. Um, but her idea of donut economics, it, um, it builds on this diagram, which I would think, you know, if you've been in the sustainability space for any time you've seen before. So this is um, Stefan Edel's work from 2015 about planetary boundaries. And it shows how over time, especially um, around 1950, there was this um, really big inflection point uh, the great acceleration, they call it, where we've just like blown past all these different planetary boundaries. So um, according to multiple metrics, we're exceeding the ability of the earth to, you know, absorb and be resilient to um, the, the harm that we're affecting. So what Rawworth does that I think is brilliant is she reconceptualizes this idea or this image of boundaries and creates a diagram that looks like this and says, you know, there is an ecological ceiling, right? And if we overshoot Earth's carrying capacity, you know, that's a recipe for disaster. But then she also takes advantage of the middle of the circle and says that um, there are also minimums that must be in place to support human well-being, right? So we can't overshoot the earth, but we can't under-deliver on, um, on human needs. And um, 
she provides this great detail about what's needed, you know, as the social foundation or the fundamental components of, of human um, well-being, you know, things that are necessary for, um, for people to function as contributing citizens. So I really like this because it talks about both sides, right? The, the limits provided by the ecosystem, but um, the floor that we need to provide in terms of meeting basic human needs. And um, sadly, you know, our current state is we have both a shortfall and an over and an overshoot. So it um, Rawworth promotes as her donut economy is that we this is what we need to work for the green space where. Um, there's safe and just conditions for humanity to thrive. And the way that's accomplished is through a regenerative and restorative economy. So you can call that donut economics, you can call it sustainable development or the triple bottom line or ESG. And I don't care what term you use, use the term that works and motivates people and creates change. Um, but the important thing is to take action. And so, um, from that statement, instead of focusing on um, the many ways we're failing to live in the donut, what I want to do is share with you um, some, some reasons for optimism, some data about what I think are really encouraging trends. Um, but also, you just hit the pause button. Um, I think you can tell I'm really excited about these topics and, and see if anyone wants to make a comment or, or ask a question at this point. Okay, fair enough. Um, so um, the first is uh, this statement from the Business Roundtable. So you can think of Business Roundtable as the voice of corporate America. And in 2019, they issued this statement that really sent shockwaves through the corporate world because it, it redefined what the purpose of a corporation is. You know, why do businesses exist? And it, it said, profit motive is not enough. So it's a real shift from like the 1980s when it was all about um, the Benjamins to a focus on, you know, the role of business in promoting dignity in promoting meaning. Um, healthy environment, economic opportunity for all, and the ways that companies do this, like providing healthcare. Um, the second like source of optimism that also um, created some big waves was um, statements from the CEO of BlackRock. So if you don't know BlackRock, um, it is the largest investment company in the world. And every year the CEO, Larry Fink, writes a letter. Um, so the letter is read by you know, all the companies he invests in, people that want money from him and people that have money to invest. So he's really a influential voice. Um, maybe not like Elon Musk, but kind of you know, approaching that level. When, when Larry Fink speaks, people they hear him. And, um, as early as 2019, but what I have here is his 2020 letter, he uh, was picking up on what Michael Porter talked about, this concept of shared value, that corporations must have a purpose that's bigger than profits. Um, it's not just about shareholders, it's about stakeholders um, and capitalism driven by mutually beneficial relationships. So again, shared value. A company has to create value for and be valued by its full range of stakeholders and a, a focus here on the long term. So that was very influential. And you know, I felt very good about kicking off um, the semester when his uh, first letter like this came out um, in January 2019. And, and he hasn't let me down every year since then. I can start out my environmental strategy class by saying like, even Larry Fink is saying, this is a great idea. So along those lines, uh, Walmart too is also on board. And 
I'm one of those people that has, you know, loved to, to hate Walmart um, since like the documentary, the high price of, of the high cost of low prices in the 90s. Um, but Walmart has done more good for sustainability than pretty much any other company. Now, I would argue that, but I also say they have a long way to go and they are not without their faults. So um, I don't have um, rose colored glasses when it comes to Walmart. But what I wanted to share with you from Walmart is from their latest sustainability report and the fact that they're also focused on creating shared value. They're also talking about environmental and social factors, right? Um, thinking internally, but also about their supply chain and the people in their supply chains and the people in the communities that are affected um, by their sourcing of goods. And much like um, Hollander would have you do, Walmart is focusing on, or at least it says it's starting this journey of focusing on regeneration, restoring, renewing, replenishing. <coughs> so I find this to be good news because originally like back when Porter first started talking about shared value and Walmart started a sustainability journey like in 2006, Walmart was all about minimizing harm right, reducing greenhouse emissions, reducing waste, which are novel, which are, you know, important goals, um, but just not enough. Um, so I think this is a source of optimism that they're going to try to go you know, beyond zero. The other thing that's noteworthy about Walmart, and I think is especially instructive for the healthcare sector, is uh, Walmart's focus on data. So what you see in this graph is um, their profits, right? Their, how much money they've made um, over years. And, and you can see uh, they continue to do well financially. But in the line here, what you see are um, greenhouse gas emissions um, in million tons of CO2 equivalents. And starting around you know, 2014, there's a decline. And so this breaks the paradigm that you can't do well and do good. Right, you can have economic growth, actually Walmart's proving it, and reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. So um, they're a positive example and um, they have the data to prove it and they've set goals and they're monitoring, you know, are we on track to meet our goals or not? Um, our goal as part of, you know, what the world from the Paris Accords needs to do, uh, which is reach net zero by 2050. Great, and I was mindful of the time. I was a little afraid of this, like kind of over-prepared. Um, but let me show the final slides I had prepared were um, some, more, some more data about uh, drivers. So, you know, why does Walmart do that? What's caused BlackRock and um, the Business Roundtable to change their tune? Well, I would say there are three categories of um, drivers. One thing is it's just good for business, right? Um, the other thing, is, and what's interesting about this is that this trend is, you know, um, the reason companies are engaging in sustainability saying it's good for business from 2012 to 2017, these have kind of either flatlined or, or been on the decline, whereas reacting to stakeholder pressure, so internal and external drivers um, are really all on the increase. And then most notably, a focus on vision is more and more behind companies' um, activity in the ESG space. And I wanted to point out, I think this is really exciting for healthcare because um, of the vision to, to do well and promote health, right? To, to do no harm, that's part of the Hippocratic Oath, right? And this next slide shows that if your sustainability strategy is aligned with your mission, and I would say in healthcare, it's totally aligned, you're gonna have the most success. So the graph is showing like if your 
your CSR your sustainability strategy is not integrated, um, you're not going to achieve the same success as when it is integrated. And just I really do want to have, I think it's so interesting to hear other people's thoughts. So um, maybe I'll just tell you um, real quickly, I have some stats again talking about the pervasiveness of the integration of ESG and how widespread reporting on actual quantitative data has become. Um, and there are international standards and guidelines so that um, there's standardization about what's reported and how it's reported um, and a real focus on climate change because companies recognize that climate change is real. They're not having the debates that our politicians are having. They're taking action. And why are they taking action? Because like this says, 79% of Fortune 500 companies consider climate change a business risk. And they've sliced and diced it. All these different kinds of risks, which means all these different strategies that are more or less appropriate given what industry you're in. And um, what's notable, I think, is that the healthcare sector really lags others in thinking strategically about what risk are we exposed to and how can we start taking steps to mitigate those risks. Thank you, Karen. And, oh. Yeah, so I just have one more sentence. And, and the government's gonna mandate it, right? This is on the horizon. Um, so, gosh, Emily, I've taken all, all of the air, but, um, this sounds like a of, perfect time to transition. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. let's do Thank that. You. So I have, Emily, here's your data and, um, you know, maybe you could speak to that and the reporting and what we want to see next. Sure. Okay. So let me share my screen. So I, I organized a very, very short uh, little uh, chat here um title yes can you see it okay so um i actually wrote i have a recent paper in new england journal of medicine on sustainability and healthcare that i'll point everyone to because this is going to be pretty short uh and and the paper that we wrote digs into it in a much deeper way so okay why is it not going here okay you gave a few definitions of sustainability. In the past, they were basically statements about what sustainability was around meeting the needs of future generations, um, uh, of the current generation, but also uh, keeping in mind that we have to not uh, deprive future generations from the right to survive because we've used all the resources. Over time, the definition has become uh, a little more uh, less qualitative and a little more quantitative. This is a more recent one looking at the definition, definition of sustainability as being between uh, the environment equity and, and, and the economy, creating a balance there. I think Carol, you sort of touched on that. I think it's really, really important, however, to talk about what sustainability is not before we get to what it is and how to understand it and how to operationalize it and make it work for you. It's not a feeling not a journey how you figured out the earth is in trouble. It's not your corporate story about how you care about people. Definitely it's not a color. Uh, it's not a promise or a commitment. They don't mean anything without data. And it's certainly not green awards. Those things are not sustainable. It's not what sustainability is about right now. You talked about Michael Porter. I'm gonna go a little bit further back in time to another managerial guru, W.E. Deming, who used the words, in God we trust all others bring data. This is truer for sustainability than almost any other um, exercise we're gonna uh, undertake. Uh, after him came Drucker. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If you can't manage it, you cannot improve it. So you have to measure things. So what is sustainability now? Sustainability is quantitative. It is a number. It's a form of accounting. It, the, the terminology, as you went through so carefully, Carol, is exactly correct. There is environmental accounting. There's social accounting. What is social accounting? That's looking at 
somebody brought up their workforce, looking at workforce health and safety, looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion, looking at measures of workforce well-being. And then there's the G. What does G stand for? G stands for governance. That's looking at what your um, enterprise uh, is doing in terms of management, in terms of fair dealing, in terms of it dealing with fraud or um, waste and abuse. Uh, so each of those categories is critical to sustainability and they are all numeric, they're all quantitative. Um, as I said, it's a form of accounting. It has, has to be benchmarked and tracked over time. It has to be assured by accountants, just like a financial statement would be assured by credible third parties. And it must be transparently disclosed to all stakeholders. You gotta share the info, you gotta share the data. That's what sustainability is all about now. So to reiterate, if it is not measured, it's not sustainable. If the data is not assured by accountants, it's not sustainable. If the data is not transparently, systematically, and periodically disclosed to all stakeholders, it's not sustainable. Anything short of this, don't buy it. Ask for proof, buyer beware. Ask for disclosures of clear baseline measures using standardized frameworks. You mentioned a few, you pulled up GRI, you pulled up the CDP, there are others. There is a convergence around these frameworks. We're getting better and better at this. This is an evolving area, but there are frameworks that can be used that can get everybody on the same page and putting that information out there in the same way. Look for greenwashing, ask for the proof, where's the beef, commitments. I, this is a little hobby of mine. Every now and again, I'll go back in time and look at different health systems that have made commitments or promises around sustainability. Now it's a few years on down the line. All I can find is the press release. I can't find any data. That's not sustainability. Awards without transparent data, not sustainability. Voluntary programs, signing up for a voluntary disclosure program with no disclosed data, that's not sustainability. Vague language about a journey or a story around sustainability or data behind paywalls, none of that is sustainability. So just to sort of conclude this, you wanna, this little section of my talk, you, if you wanna be an advocate, you wanna ask your enterprise's leadership for their ESG data. And I don't care if you're profit, nonprofit, I don't care if you're publicly traded or not publicly traded. It, it, while this was invented on Wall Street, it's going to affect everybody. Even though most hospitals are not for profit, they're going to look for ratings. They're going to look for credit ratings. They're going to look to the capital mm -hmm. markets to invest in them. Are we out of time? Um, and you're, they're going to have to supply their ESG data, whether or not they are publicly traded and um, at investors' mercy. Talk about claim climate change all the time and call out greenwashing, obviously voting, all solutions to climate change as we are headed toward breaching probably in 2026, the 1.5 degrees Celsius, at least for a, a period of time. In a carbon constrained world, we're gonna have to car count carbon. That means numbers, everybody all the time, no exceptions. Healthcare should be first in line given our mission. Invitations for voluntary engagement are not likely to be successful. We had that here in New York City, eh, didn't work out so great. ESG is the language and framework that helps professionalize this in, in um, healthcare. I think we should all begin to use that language, ask for the data. It can be done. The National Health Service in England has been tracking their carbon emissions since 2009. They've been able to demonstrate a clear 26% reduction in emissions, even though their, um, their use of their healthcare delivery has actually gone up in total use. If we wanna ask health systems to do some very basic stuff, I'll point you to just some suggestions of basic metrics that we could ask from healthcare systems that in each of the categories in terms of environment, social um, and governance can be done. Other health systems have done robust ESG reports. Dignity Health doesn't exist anymore. It was a victim of a merger or an acquisition, which happens all the time in healthcare. You really have to follow this every day to follow the concentration that's going on. But anyway, they track their greenhouse gas emissions. They credibly reported it. It was verified by a third party accountant. They give a great uh, social uh, metric here on what they're doing for their employees. We don't have time for this, but there are ways to sort of mandate this in the health system. Right now, HHS just called for voluntary reporting. I don't think that's gonna get uh, the buy-in that they that we ultimately need to meet the crisis at hand. Um, so I would say ask for ESG, send it up the flagpole, write letters to leadership, all the companies that you deal with and ask them for their data.
that's much shorter than I planned, but <laughs> I hope there's time for questions. I apologize okay. for being an air hog. I hate it when other people do that. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Perfect. So thank you both so much. I really appreciate that um, all, all the really great information. So um, in an earlier conversation, Doctor, he had mentioned, kind of noted her surprise that given the common pre prevalence of ESG, ESG in other sectors that the health systems aren't already doing this. And uh, Dr. Say, you sort of alluded to the, the paucity there. So, so why aren't we doing this yet? Um, what are your thoughts on that? And you offered some recommendations, but please expand on, on uh, ways you feel like we should move forward. Right. So you're right, the healthcare sector is sort of the last in on this, even though it would seem it should be the first in. And there, there are probably a couple of reasons for that. One is that they operate on very slim margins. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, which Carol alluded to, is that this is a cost center. It's not a saving center or cost avoidance center, that these activities would actually not be cost effective. In fact, it's the opposite. When companies undertake this, the data now is pretty clear coming out of the business world that it actually saves on costs. And we can get into all that. I would refer you to my paper, which went through the data that shows that in every category, environment, social and governance, there is cost savings associated with collecting and managing this data. The last thing I would say is that a lot of healthcare executives don't come from Wall Street. They come from within our little sector. They're less likely to be um, familiar with what's happening on Wall Street and why this um, particular form of accounting is now going to be what's happening. Five years from now, they're all going to be doing it, um, but they probably haven't heard about it. And finally, they think, well, you know, we're providing enough societal benefit. Don't mm -hmm. ask us to do this. But the fact of the matter is that from a performance perspective, again, I don't care what kind of entity you are or organization you are, this provides benefits up and down the line. It is not a cost center. It saves in every single category. In environment, it saves on energy costs. In social, it saves on just workplace uh, retention. Saving employees from leaving is, is a huge cost avoidance. Every employee that leaves costs the company an enormous amount of money. And finally, on governance, linking uh, leadership pay to improvement in environment and social can save on costs. So it, it's a legacy attitude, I think, that will change little by little. Um, I know HHS did ask for voluntary participation. I, that's not likely to to be robust enough to get engage all of them. I think what we really need to do is we need to link it to either certificate uh, for conditions of participation through CMS, give the health systems the information and the um, material and the uh, support they need to capture this data and to report out on it. It will, I think, eventually become business as usual. Yeah. Thank you for that, Emily. So true. and. You know, why I like to use the Walmart example is because you, know, you mentioned that healthcare is so low margin. Well, Walmart's all about low cost and they're not going to do anything that costs them a penny. Um, so to have Walmart as a sustainability leader and doing the, the work on the metrics and reporting and the audits that you talked about um, really shows, I think, if the proof of concept, like if, if Walmart's doing this and they can do it in the ways that Emily suggests it needs to happen, certainly healthcare system can do it too. I do know that there are a few large health systems I've heard recently who have engaged accounting firms to help them do a full GRI style report. So there are early adopters. I think they will win the um, consumer sentiment award when they begin to demonstrate this data and how it links to the overall health of their patients and their communities. I think they're gonna win the um, advertising war, if you will, in those very concentrated market, in those few markets that are not concentrated, one health system will be able to distinguish itself from all the others by really engaging this, engaging in this and looping in the community benefits they're providing and the sort of downstream health benefits of these actions to their patients and their community members, their employees. I mean, 
Hospitals tend to be, in many communities, the largest employer. Um, so what are they doing to keep their employees safe, healthy, and happy? Um, ESG gives them a quantitative way to express that. Right. Uh, I think in the war for talent, it's really important, too. Um, and if you think about, um, there's, there's a lot of data that shows millennials and Gen Zs care about the environment, number one. So if you want to attract great doctors and retain them, you know, you're going to want to create an organization that has values that align with your employees. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's right. And I think it is the future. There are headwinds. You know, the midterms could undo more than a little bit of this. I do think the SEC rule is going to be litigated. But I also think that most companies have recognized the benefit of this, have recognized that Larry Fink is absolutely right. We cannot have business operations in an environment that's where the resources are destroyed and the planet's on fire and there's too many storms to get your product to market. So whether or not the political winds shift against this, and I think there's gonna be a lot of lawsuits around the SEC rule, I think big business is going to have to do this because they cannot afford not to do it. Right. Well, they are they are doing it. They are doing it, hundred percent. And they're not backing away despite Elon's temper tantrum the other day um, on Twitter. I don't know if anyone followed that. It was kind of fun. Um, I don't think they're gonna back away. Well, are, are there any, um, oh, John, go ahead. Yeah, I did post a message in chat, but I, and I know we're close to out of time, but I, I would love to know from Emily how uh, Mount Sinai has organized its sustainability into the administrative structure and employee culture, because we're trying to, in the process of trying to do that currently at Duke, and have looked at other institutions, and sometimes it sits in the um, materials and management department, sometimes it's other part, places, and we we really are trying to figure out how to integrate it into the whole um, employee culture and so not just unless, leave it up to certain people. Sure. You need buy-in from the CEO. <laughs> Without total yeah. and complete buy-in from the CEO, it will not happen. And that's why the governance is so important. I don't know mm -hmm. what many hospitals, CEO and boards, there's not a lot of independence there. I have no idea about Duke, but they tend to be friends and friends of friends. And so you need a board that is also on, on board with this, if you will, that will put pressure on the CEO to, to do this. So otherwise you can have all the recycling programs you want. If they're not systematic, if they are not linked to someone's job description, performance and pay, it probably won't happen long-term because champions leave, champions get exhausted. It has to be the highest buy-in and the way to do that is to pressure from the bottom. The pressure from the top is coming because I think a lot of CEOs are getting, a, we're gonna have to do this stuff. Um, but if you ask them for data, if, if you say, particularly medical students, because when medical students get excited um, or interested in something, they kind of have to respond to that because the um, competition for medical students is so fierce, number one. And I think eventually ESG data is going to be, or I hope will be incorporated into something like US News and World Report top healthcare centers, top schools. Um, that way students will have an opportunity particularly those who are highly sought after, to make a decision based on what that a particular institution is doing around ESG. And that, that again is quantitative. If your CEO is not into it, I, it's, I can't help you, it won't work. Jennifer I think that's and I are- the hard truth. Jennifer and I have been working hard at that. <laughs> Yes, and, and certainly um, our leadership is, is uh, exploring and listening, so we appreciate that. Well, we are at time. I really want to um, thank um, Dr. He and Dr. Sine again for, for being such great speakers today. And I also want to uh, um, 
send a particular shout out to Jason Elliott for helping us, for stepping in um, and all his work behind the scenes as we were in a transition. And uh, Diane, who's still there, I, you, um, thank you as well. She's one of our, our interns who helped behind the scenes. So thank you all for joining us and have a great afternoon. Thank you.